Good morning. So I used to be a part of this congregation, but it was still about two kilometers that way. This was the last time I preached in any congregation in the south. But man, it does my heart good to see so many other people that I knew from then. So where's your hun? That I greeted this morning. Has he run away again? Oh, she is. Yohan, when we chatted this morning, I felt God say the following to you. I felt God say, your heart is to serve, and you've, and you've said it when I knew you then, and you've said it this morning again, that all I want to do is serve. But God is saying this to you. You are to lead. The way that you are to serve the body of Christ is to lead. You saw that to you before, and you've run away. I don't know where you've been in the last couple of years, but He's calling you to lead. He's giving you a strong pastoral heart. He's calling you to lead men in this congregation from that position. You've got the character, you've got the depth, you've got the Holy Spirit. Be a be- Time to be obedient, buddy. Come on. And I shared a word with Marinus when we met on, Mon- uh, on Monday, just for the congregation, I told him I shared with you guys. So if you knew Hansi, he was a formidable man that led this congregation, that planted this congregation, those that knew him, they have to love the guy. Uh, very passionate. I mean, he even called his son after Braveheart. Okay, his second name is Wallace. Okay, he's got that fighting spirit. And I, and I, and I was praying for the sermon and for you as a congregation. Uh, I, I felt God share this vision with me, this, this Braveheart sword, this long sword. And he told me that was the weapon that he gave Hansi. And if you know Hansi, I think you will agree with me. Okay, that's who Hansi is. And Marinus has taken over as the senior leader, but he has been fighting with that sword up to now, but I feel God is saying he's changing that. He showed me a vision where he's taken that sword and he's melting the iron. And as I was showing this Marinus, I couldn't see what he was making. I saw him carve out a form that he was going to put this iron into. But as I was preparing this week, I saw the weapon, and it was a quarterstaff. So it's not the most sexiest weapon. I'm allowed to say sexy. Yeah. <laughs> It's a quarter staff, and usually a quarter staff is made of wood, but yay high. But this quarter staff is made of iron. And I felt God say to the congregation two things for Marinus, but also for you guys. To wield a quarter staff made of iron will take an exceptionally strong person. It's usually wood. So Marinus has entered into a season, I believe, where God is strengthening Marinus. It's going to be a tough season for him. He's going to need you guys to be behind him. But God is growing a phenomenal leader. The second thing is that a quarterstaff is a multi-tool. Unlike a sword that is used in offensive, a quarterstaff is both defensive and offensive. Okay, it's used both ways, but it's also used to help you walk, and it's also used to guide. Okay, so where, where the congregation under the previous leader had one focus, I believe God is saying that this congregation will have multiple tools to reach lost people. There'll be a multitude of people coming in, different people with different gifts, and they will all belong, they're all called to minister, and we will see a massive move in Highfelt and further than Highfelt. Okay, so I believe that's a word for you guys. Okay. So yes, Francois, there's a picture of my family, I think, there we go. Three photogenic people that all look the same, and then me. Okay, so that's my wife, Teresa. That's our son, he's four and a half, Kai, and our little daughter, Quinn, uh, who's one, and the first years of all of us. So uh, there's a three and a half year difference there. It wasn't planned. We had a miscarriage in the middle, which, which wasn't a bad thing in itself, but now we, uh, we have a three and a half year old and we've been out of diapers for about, about a year. We haven't been on bottles for about six months. We, we have a little man that, that can listen to us when we speak, and you can have a conversation and give good instruction, and then you're back in it. Okay, another thing you're back in is that a baby screams on demand. They want something, there's only one way to ask. Just lift the voice, and it's not in praise. Okay. So, and that's babies. They're hungry, they scream. They're tired, they scream. They're dirty, they scream. And then we give. 
And it's okay because that's, that's the only way that babies know how. But sometimes you get adults that are the same. That scream when they want something. That throw their toys when they don't get. They're supposed to become mature and learn how to ask in humility, but they don't. And so we get broken adults. And we see that in the Bible. We see that with the whole of Israel as they go through the wilderness, don't we? Yeah. And the unfortunate thing is they, they saw some of the most fantastic things that God did. They get to the Red Sea, God opens the Red Sea. They let you walk through on dry ground, pillars of water around them. Just imagine. They get to the other side, they have a pillar of smoke, a pillar of fire leading them. They get to a brook and they do, they're thirsty, but the brook is bitter. God changes the brook. They have drinking water. They get thirsty again, Moses smacks a rock, there's water. They fight against Midian, they lose. They raise the hands of Moses, Joshua wins. So many things that God did, they get hungry. Around six million people get hungry. Now that's the SR project for you. God sends manna enough for six million people. Quails enough for six million people. Daily this happens. And yet, these people that saw all these great things of God manifesting did the following. They lacked faith before the Red Sea. They complained over the water. They complained in the desert. They said, why did you bring us out to the die? We should be back in Egypt, where they were killed, beaten, slaved, went through hunger the same way, but they looked back and longed for bondage, while a God was doing miracles among them. God told them to have enough manna daily. They connected more than they need, spoiled. They attempted to connect manna on a Sunday when God said no, and there was none. They engaged in idolatry of building a golden calf. A mere 40 days, just more than a month of not seeing their leader, having seen all that God did up to that point. And then they get to the promised land. Just a couple of weeks in the desert, guys, a couple of weeks, they get to the promised land that they don't have enough faith after seeing God move to go into the promised land. And so we get to the end of Exodus. And we start a new book called Joshua. And we're going to be studying Joshua today. But if you're an avid reader like myself, you know that you get to the end of a paragraph or, or a chapter, and they leave you on a cliffhanger, because they want you inside the next chapter. Okay, this is kind of what happens. So we, we, we're left at the end of this book. Here is a group of people that are the next generation. It's the next family. It's the next lineage. Those that did not trust God had all died. Instead of spending a couple of weeks in the desert, they spent 40 years. That's nice punishment. But the next generation has stood up. The next generation is now at the same river their parents were at. They're looking at the same country across the way. They have a new leader in Joshua. Moses has passed the baton, and now they have to go conquer. So now the question is, will this next generation trust God? Will this next generation walk in his ways, obey his commands, experience his blessing, and actually take the land that was promised 450 years earlier to Abraham? That's our questions. And so we're going to get into Joshua. We're going to start at the back, and then we'll make our, our way forward again. And the main verse is Joshua 24, 14 to 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors who served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. That is for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for women, men and women who long to obey, that long to see you move, Father, that will give up a Sunday morning to come and sit and worship you as the one true God. Thank you for your gifting amongst these people, Father. Thank you for your lost soul that are still captive in their hearts. 
Thank you that you moved and you've placed everyone here, Father. You build your church and you call people and place them in a family. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that your word is truth. Holy Spirit, won't you take the truth today and just open up people's hearts? Will you speak this morning? Will you capture the attention of people? Thank you, Father, that you have sent the Holy Spirit, that you have sent your Son, that we may have the word and have the Spirit to guide us into all truth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Okay, so all I'm going to attempt today is have fun. Have fun with God. Because that's what Sundays to me is all about. Sundays is about celebrating what God has done in church during the week. And we get together and we have some fun together as a family. We have some fun with God. So I trust you're going to enjoy this morning as we get into Joshua. And we're going to start in Joshua 1, because that's kind of where Joshua begins. Yeah. Interesting thing before I get to Joshua, the topic today is being on mission together as a faithful family. And as we read the scriptures, it's important to notice that God does everything in family. Even when he calls leaders, it's in context of family. I'll give you two examples. As they go into the promised land, God instructs them to sack Jericho. They meet a, a prostitute called Rahab. He saves Rahab, but he also saves her mother, her father, her brothers, her sisters, and all that were with them. He saves the family. And he adds the family to Israel, so much so that she's mentioned in the genealogies of Jesus. But on the other side, you get an Israelite. After the sacking, God says, you take nothing from Jericho. Nothing. It's all tainted. Nothing. One guy takes something, and he thinks God won't know. He buries it underneath his tent. Very strategic. And they lose the next battle. Joshua goes before God and says, what have you done to us? Like, we, we kind of usually do that. We go complain against Jesus, don't we? Why are we going through this? And God's only response there was, but you didn't obey my command. One liner. So they throw lots and they find out it's, it's this guy, Achan. They take him, his wife, his uh, sons, his daughters, all his cattle, even his donkeys, they stone all of them, and then they burn them. God has everything in a family, and he will take those out of his family when they look for him, when they obey him, when they call to him, because Rahab's words were, we have heard how your God has taken you through the Red Sea. They did not see it, they only heard it. And they said, we know about your God, and we tremble. Our legs became like water, and they only heard about it. But the people who saw it will still not obey. She acted in faith, and God pulled the whole family in. Achan, who's part of the family, did not obey and was cast out. God does everything in family. And he does it in our households first, and then in this context. It's our households coming together in the greater family that God uses to impact nations. And that is God's heart for us, is that our families will stand on the truth, we will obey, we will walk in the blessing, we will get together in settings like this where we can celebrate, and the testimony of God will go from here and impact our societies, and impact the nations. That was God's heart for Israel. That was their call. Be a nation of priests so that the nations around them will see the one true God. Did they succeed? Well, so our first point. God's abiding presence is the key to strength and courage. It centers us on the Lord's instruction and success in the mission. Now, I love the scripture that I put up here today. Just put up the scripture quickly. Next one. Joshua 1. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Who doesn't want a word of God starting that way? Man, how's that for security? As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I have not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
Can you guys see the sandwich? It's fantastic. I will be with you in the beginning. I will be with you at the end. Two bookends. And in the middle, obey me and you will be successful. Obey me and you will be successful. But the patty in the middle. Look, my son doesn't need anything except the patty in the middle. <laughs> meditate. Be in the Word of God and meditate. Being in the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God brings us to a place where it's easy to obey. See, the word abide that we used means to carry on in. So what is he saying? He says, carry on in the presence of God. Carry on in me. And the only way to do that is to spend time in Him. He is the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus. Spending time with God means spending time in the Word of God. Allowing the Holy Spirit to deepen our understanding of who God is. The whole Trinity, not just Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit. So that we may walk with them daily. And I fail. I'm pretty sure all of us fail. I think Jesus is probably the only one who could do that. Why do we fail? Because we all have gifts. And if you're raised in the 80s or earlier, like myself, you were taught, make a plan. Get it done. Boer make a plan. So we were taught to sort out stuff on our own. So it goes against us to actually lift this. To daily trust upon God, to say, I have to make a decision. Because we can make the decision. God says, not so with us. He says, you spend time. And even if what I tell you to do is what you would have done anyway, it is me walking with you. Because my heart is relationship with you. I want to be with you. I want to be on this journey with you. And maybe, just maybe, he has a better idea than you or I had. Scientific studies has even proven that if you read the Word of God at least four times a week, four times a week, there's a 66% chance and up of being more joyful, not being in depression, being more confident. There's a whole list of stuff. You can go Google. A whole study done on just reading the Word of God four times a week or more. Massive change. And we are. There's a spiritual impact because the Word is alive. And so God asks us to do that. The second point that He calls us to do is to be in unity. Be in unity. I put the scripture there. It's in chapter 18. It's when the land has been conquered. And they all get together. They put up the temple of meeting because they, they crave to have God present. And they divide the land. They are full unity. But they got there by working together. You will read in the previous chapters like Judah would say to, uh, to Simeon, come up with us and come fight with us. And when you go up, we will come with you. They worked together. They were united in a mission. They were united in values. There's a movie that I love. And, and dude movies always make good sermons. Kind of always do. Um, remember the Titans. It was released in the year 2000. Who's seen the movie Remember the Titans? Ah, uh, good people. <laughs> so it's based on a true story. It's uh, in 1971. It's in a town called Alexandria in the U.S. And they are stopping segregation. So the white school and the black school has to become one, which is difficult in itself. But now the football team, it's a football movie, has to become one. And there we have a problem. Because what the school board also decides to do, just to make a point, is they appoint a black coach uh, called Coach Boone to be the coach of the football team. And they just don't get along, obviously. But Coach Boone takes them on a camp. And at this camp, they still don't listen, so they do three practices a day. Because he wants to break them so they can get together as a team, which happens. They get together. The white leader and the black leader, they form an alliance, and so the others follow. Leadership determines, guys. They get together, and this team that are, that's in a smaller school than a lot of the other teams, that have less good players on paper, that have less money as some of the other teams, whose coach has not been proven like some of the other coaches, this team starts winning. And they become state champions. 
They end up being the second best team in the U.S. in 1971 because they came together. They had one purpose, it's to win the game. We have one mission as every nation. It's to honor God. And we honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit empowered, and socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. That's what we do. That's our mission. And here, Marinos can discipline me later. If that's not you, then pray to God if God has placed you here. Because God adds to family. Because we will keep speaking about that and you will keep being unhappy hearing that every week. Because we're going to say you need to make disciples. We're going to tell you that you need to engage the lost. We're going to ask you, who's your neighbor? Have you shared the gospel? Why? Because we have the same values. Lordship, evangelism, discipleship, leadership, and family. And physical family before spiritual family. We do not sacrifice our families on the altar of ministry. That's our values. They don't change. That's our mission. It's not going to change. So we need to be united. You need to be united in those things. Because if you are, God can do miracles. God can take a bunch of people that on paper are not the strongest, who on paper do not have the most giftings, the most resources, and he can affect major change. Not just in the town, not just in the, in the country, but in the nations. Just like a football team did because they shared the same common vision and values. Number three, the sovereignty of God fulfills all his good promises and gives the people identity, a place to belong, and rest. Now remember, the promises to these people stood for 450 years. That's a longer time than Jan van Riebeek arrived in the Cape, to give you perspective. Okay, that's way, way long. Longer than we've been a republic. More than four times. So what was the promise to Abraham? Abraham, look at the stars. Says, I will make your descendants more than what you can see. And I will give them a land that I've promised you. Land and a people. And as they get here, eventually, there is a people. Because in Egypt, they became a people. Coming out of Egypt, the people grew. And now they come into the land that God has promised them, Canaan, 450 years earlier. Every single promise that God had given them, he had fulfilled. See, God is sovereign, which means the following. Everything that happens, either God does it himself or he allows it. Now, that is a tough piece of theology to, to take in sometimes. Because sometimes we go through difficult times. Sometimes we go through hardships. God is still sovereign. And his sovereignty, he took his people into slavery. It's part of the promise to Abraham, by the way. If you go read when God made the covenant with Abraham, he spoke to Abraham and he said, your people will be captured for 400 years because the sins of the Canaanites have not, not become or come to fruition. See, a lot of people look at that and they think it's harsh. But on the other hand, people look at the command to come and kill these people. The point of this is that God gave the Canaanites 400 years to repent. He gave them 400 years. To me, that sounds like a God full of grace. 400 years. And when that was done, he called these people out. So my, my question to you is, do you have a promise from God? Do you have a promise from God? Because if he has promised it to you, he will obey. And if you're sitting there, you think you don't, the Bible has 8,000 promises from God. You have all of them. 8,000 promises. And the one, when you get into the one-to-one, -one, you get first off. If you will follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. That's a promise for you. God says in, one, in Corinthians that if you're generous, if your heart is generous, I will increase your righteousness. He says if you sow, I will increase your seed. Two promises. Philippians 4, promises. As we go through the Bible, 8,000 promises and God is faithful in his sovereignty 
to make every single one happen in your life? What does he ask of you? Well, in the case of becoming a fisher, he just asks you to follow. Increasing righteousness, be generous. You want to lead? Follow. Serve, Johan. <laughs> what does he want? He wants us to walk next to him. He wants us to be in him. He wants to be intimate with us and us being intimate with him, the first point. That's what he wants. He wants to be co-laborers with us. No, this, God is sovereign. He doesn't need us. But he wants us. His law heart aches for us. He doesn't need us to fulfill his promises. But he's a heart that needs to have us next to him. And that's what God, God wants. Success in mission demands the removing of idols and worshiping God alone. And he's only taking it there. Because all of us have idols. And you might go, yeah! It's not about what you have in your house. It's what you have in your heart. In the Old Testament, God looked outside a person. In the New Testament, God looks inside a person. In the Old Testament, there were tablets of stone that he gave. And Romans, Paul writes, those tablets are written on our hearts. God looks at our hearts. And it's important, maybe just let me do this as a little segue. This one's for free. That when we look at the law, there's a letter to the law. But there's also a spirit to the law. See, in the Old Testament, God says, do not murder. In the New Testament, Jesus comes and he says, it's not just that. It's if you're angry at someone, you've already committed murder in your heart. See, Jesus is emphasizing the spirit of the law. Not only the letter. God is calling us into the spirit of the law. Follow him. Be intimate. But that means we need to deal with, with idols. So I started with a scripture. It says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. All faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt and serve the Lord. And then he goes on to restate that. But he also says, the gods of the Amorites. It's the people they were amongst at that stage. So what's he saying to us? He says some of us look behind like they did. They look towards Egypt and what they had in Egypt. So we tend to look behind us who we were, what we had, even in our sinful nature. And we long back for that. That's your one choice. Those idols you served back then when you were without God. But God says there's another choice. It's serving the idols we are right now. So what's outside? Corruption, greed, faithlessness, men being absent in the house, men longing after, after other women that are not their wives, LGBTQ, gender fluidity, becomes nasty. Deconstructed church. There's a new one coming to a church near you. You know about deconstructing church? Yeah. Bad news. And if you don't know the scripture, if you're not abiding in Christ, it'll get you. So God is saying you can look back to those gods, you can look what's around you right now, or you can look to him. But he says you need to choose. And that choice has to be in faithfulness. So there's no, a little bit of that one, a little bit of this one, and God, when I need him, he says no. It is a faithful choice. It's an utter commitment to choose one or the other. And you know what? That's liberating. That's liberating. God is not forcing himself on anyone. Isn't that magnificent? He can, but he doesn't. He gives every single person in the world the choice. He's giving you that choice again today. Because that means make that choice daily. It's not a once-off. It's a daily choice. It's a sanctification daily. It's walking with God daily. It's responding to what he's telling you daily. It's repenting daily of what is not in line with his word and the idols in our lives daily. And then there's power that manifests in our lives because God is oozing out of who we are. People see our, our decisions and they will question why, but they see the fruit and then they will know how you made such a stupid decision concerning the world. 
but you have such fantastic things coming in. There's a harvest, but we didn't understand the decision, so we didn't understand the harvest. You get to share the upside down gospel. That's how God works. But idols. See, an idol is basically only this. It's a functional savior. It's something that you actually need. You need it. And God wants to give it to you, but you can find it outside of God. Identity. God gives you identity. You are a beloved son. Romans says that uh, everybody that is called upon God, the Spirit testifies in us that we are sons of the Most High God. You have identity. You are so significant that while you were sinning all the way from birth, God counted you so significant that 2,000 years ago, He died on a cross for those sins that you were yet to commit. Knowing, standing outside of time, seeing all the corruption in your life, in your heart, in your mind, choosing to hang on a cross for your sins, you are that significant. That God, the Word, became flesh and went to the cross for you. See, we look for things that we need, legitimate things outside of God. And those are our idols. The Sheikh of Dubai. The guy who started Dubai. 1966, they found oil, and their Sheikh started building Dubai. So he, he had a quote. So put the quote up there. My grandfather rode a camel. My father rode a camel. I drive a Mercedes. My son will drive a Land Rover. His son will drive a Land Rover. But his son will ride a camel again. He saw generations ahead. And this was actually a warning. Pretty much that the oil will dry up. And if they don't put stuff in place to create an economic hub that can drive itself, they will all end up in the desert again with nothing. That should be our perspective. Generation, family. It is in your household raising up your kids to love Jesus. And it's not just the, the, the kid's Bible. Kai loves the Bible and he chooses the same stories at the moment. It's the Garden of Eden and the crucifixion. He's four years old. I don't know why. Okay, A couple of months ago, it was David and Daniel. The burning oven. Okay, What's our job? It's not just to read those stories, but to teach him where Jesus is in those stories. See, I had to uh, raise up my kid, three and a half years old, who wants to be David, and telling me, you're not David. And daddy's not David. You and I are both other Israelites that are scared and hiding. Jesus is David. Jesus is the one that comes and conquers for you, that does for you, that hears your prayers and answers those prayers for you. We've got to teach them who Jesus is. And then we've got to equip them so they can teach those generations that will come behind them. If we don't, we are one generation away from extinction. This church could cease to exist in one generation. We don't just have kids' church for the sake of kids' church. We have kids' church because there's, there's a generation that needs to hear the gospel. Moses is not spending his time uh, ministering to the youth so he can get a paycheck. He's ministering to the youth so we can have strong young adults going onto campus, going to the workplace with a foundation laid so that the campus ministers can build on that, evangelize campus, and we can change the world. That's why. Everything's strategic. I'm getting shouted at because of time, so let me just go to the gospel. No, I told it just to... Because <laughs> there's, there's a scripture... In Joshua 24, before Joshua gives his speech. And if you, if, you, if you don't spend time in the Old Testament, you'll miss the significance of the scripture. Why? He's telling them, you did not toil, but you're getting the land. You did not build, but you're living in cities. You did not plant anything, but you're harvesting. Why is that significant? Because in the Garden of Eden, in chapter 3 of Genesis, because of sin and the fall of man, man gets cursed. And you will toil, and you will have by the sweat of your brow. And yet, your God comes, and He says, you did not toil, but I'm giving you. You did not earn, but I'm giving you. You did not plant, but I'm giving you. Grace. Grace. 
So we read the Old Testament and we just see a God that is harsh. And we miss the gospel in the Old Testament. This is the gospel in the Old Testament that is not about the curse, it's about the blessing. It's not about us, it's about God's heart for us. I don't know that. 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. Guys in the wilderness that I started with. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Jesus. Do you think Jesus does not exist in the Old Testament? Jesus was the rock that guided them. If you read rabbinical tradition, they will tell you that Jesus was the water, first water they drank, and the last water they drank when Moses was supposed to speak to the stone but knocked it, cost him the promised land. That was the spiritual drink and the manna, the spiritual food, and that Jesus was the provision in the wilderness. How amazing is that? He was also the judge in the wilderness. So in the wilderness, the lion and the lamb. In the wilderness, love and truth. Perfect Jesus that we see in the Old Testament. How he just loves on people, guides people, feeds people, calls them into the promised land. But we also have wilderness. But see, on this side of Christ, there's a different kind of interaction we have with the wilderness. Israel, it was a place of temptation, but for Jesus, it was a place of trust in a good father. And Jesus had to go into that wilderness to break the rebellion, to be tested as Israel was, and to stand before the throne of God blameless, so that he could go to the cross and take our sins upon himself. It started in the Old Testament, thousands of years before Jesus went to the cross. And like then, today, God wants to be in your life as the lamb and the lion, the truth and the love. He wants, he wants to guide you into all truth. He wants to tell you where you're missing the mark. He wants to bring you back. He wants to love on you, walk with you. He wants to be your friend. The Holy Spirit wants to be your comforter, be your advisor. He wants to lead you into all truth. The Father's heart is inclined towards you. Will you make the choice? So just a couple of questions that you can answer for yourself. Are you abiding in Christ? Are you walking in unity with your physical and your spiritual families? What has God promised you that you are still waiting for? And do you have faith to see it happen? And what idols have you not surrendered yet to God? So I'll ask Annika to put this up on Facebook for the week, go back to it. Because the real question is this, is Christ your rock? All the other things will get put into place if Christ is your rock. If there are things that are not in place because of those other four questions, your issue lies with Jesus. Your issue lies with abiding in him surrendering to him, walking with him, loving on him, finding your joy, your purpose in him. So I want to charge you today. The Israelites said yes to that call on that day. Make the choice. They said, who are we to go against God? We will serve. Joshua said, you are not able, for God is holy. They reiterated, we will. The next book, chapter 3, says, And Joshua died, and all the elders that were with him died. And Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. One generation later, they turned from that promise to God. But that promise still stands. Will you serve the idols in your past? Will you serve the idols of today? Or will you choose God? Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you that you are a loving God. I thank you that your heart is inclined towards us, that you love us. You're not a God that wants to kill and destroy us. We are your sons. We are your daughters. And Father, we miss it. We miss it because we are, we are human and fallible. And even though we are restored in position, we still sin. And Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your voice that speaks truth into our hearts, that calls us back, that says you are righteous. You are righteous. Walk in a righteous manner. For there's a world that needs to see the church walk righteously and love on lost people. Thank you, Lord, for your message. Thank you, Lord, for hearts that were impacted this morning. And Lord, if there are people sitting here that are kicking, like you said, Paul was kicking. Lord, I pray that you will soften their hearts, that you will open up their minds, their hearts, their very spirits this morning to receive what you want them to receive. And those that are open, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your working in their lives right now. Thank you for a greater purpose, a greater future, a greater abiding in you, less idols, greater unity, and seeing your sovereign will upon this congregation and every family here this morning. Amen.